So we can't talk future of work without talking about workers. This next panel session, we're going to focus on the workforce. Specifically, what can workers do to prepare for future of work? There's a lot of trends that impact our job market. We're going to explore those in this next panel. This next panel is led by Kirk Madsen. Kirk is the VP of Sales at One Huddle. And he's going to be joined by Shade McDaniel. Shade is a city leader at the All-Stars Project of New Jersey. She oversees all of New Jersey All-Stars uh, performance-based after-school youth development programs. She is a member of the All-Star Project's National Senior Leadership Team, is currently working on advancing programs uh, to thrive on a virtual stage. Prior to All-Stars Project, she worked for 15 years in the local, state, and federal nonprofit sector to provide an innovative community-based education to thousands of young people and their families in underserved communities. So we're excited to have Shade here in this very important session. We're also joined by Chris Cooper. Chris is the CEO at Catapult. Prior to that, uh, Chris spent a ton of time at a few different organizations you might have heard of, including Prudential, uh, where he was a senior VP for strategic initiatives and corporate development. Also at Audible, where he was the EVP of international operations and new business expansion. Chris also is heavily involved in education uh, as the vice chairman of the board at the Washington Center. Excited to have Chris here. He also served as the acting business administrator for the city of Newark for six months. We also have Dr. Michelle Harrell. Uh, Dr. Harrell is the director at the Vinick Sport and Entertainment Management Program at the University of South Florida. It's a graduate school program. She's the president of Women in Sports and Events. And one of the most exciting things about Dr. Harrell is, uh, in my time knowing her, spends a tremendous amount of time in her work uh, bridging the gap between uh, what is taught in the classroom and what is important in the workforce today, specifically in the sports and entertainment space. Welcome, Michelle. So with that, I'm excited about this. We've got an action-packed panel. Kirk's got his handful. Kirk, take it away. Well, welcome everybody to a special live event, Compete, uh, the Future of Work. Uh, very excited today to be joined by uh, three fantastic folks for our panel discussion on the workforce. Uh, we are joined today by Michelle Harrell, Shade McDaniel and Chris Cooper. And if you wouldn't mind, maybe in that order, giving us a quick uh, intro and background of each of you. Yeah. Hello, Kirk. Thank you so much for, first of all, letting us be a part of this panel. Uh, my name is Michelle Harrell, and I'm the director of the Vinick Sport and Entertainment Management Program at the Muma College of Business at the University of South Florida. Yes, that's a lot. Short, short titles. Short and sweet. Yeah, <laughs> short and sweet. Um, I have been in higher education for 17 plus years. I was calculating that before uh, this panel and have always been a part of the educational system, um, conducted research on academia and bridging the gap with industry. Um, so that's really my passion and experiential learning is everything we're all about at our program and everything that we push. Um, and then to close off, uh, I've already said thank you. And the other part is I'm an avid rock climber, even though I live in Florida. There you go. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh, wow. Well. Oh, sure. Yeah. And uh, thank you for having us, Kirk. This is going to be really fun. Um, my name is Shade McDaniel. I'm the city leader of the All Stars Project of New Jersey, um, which is a privately funded national nonprofit. It was founded in 81, but it's been in Newark for about 21 years. Um, we're a leader in the field of after school development. We believe that it's a new way of engaging poverty and our mission is to transform the lives of youth and poor communities in partnership with caring adults using the developmental power of performance. And I've been working in these types of fields, nonprofit fields for 15 years, um, really working to advance communities. I'm happy to have been an all-star for five years this past June. And um, congratulations. What really intrigues me about our work is the fact that we use improv and performance to bring people together to create something new and something that they have ownership to. So that's what I've been doing in Newark and Jersey City for the past five years. And beyond. Awesome. Thank you. Chris? Perfect. Thanks again. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me and setting this up. So I am the vice chairman of the Washington Center, which is a nonprofit based out of DC, focused on experience-based learning. Um, do a lot of around internships and the coordination of internships 
uh, from colleges into primarily the DC area historically. We've obviously had to make a transition like others into more of a virtual program. And we're still trying to navigate what that's gonna look like as I'm sure folks on this call are trying to work through as well. Um, beyond my nonprofit work, uh, previously I was at Amazon. I was under a, a group called Audible, which is our audio service. Uh, audio books, audio content. I uh, ran their international division as well as their new business. Uh, and in the process of transitioning to a new role that uh, that should be coming out for the next week or so. Great. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to jump right in. Uh, and maybe um, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to start Michelle, but from here, uh, feel free everybody to, to jump in and, and add as you see fit. Um, what educational resources, Michelle, do you feel like as we think about workforce and preparing workers for the future of work, what resources do you feel are, are overvalued by employees today? And then what educational resources do you feel like are undervalued by employees today? Yeah, so, I, so this is an interesting question because I, I put some thought into it. I was like, I really struggle with it because I feel that um, we aren't doing a very good job of teaching individuals how to adapt and how to be flexible. Hmm. Right. Like in terms of like specific skills, like it really depends on the industry. Um, but the idea that we need to be teaching people how to be creative, how to be innovative, how to take initiative, um, how to adapt and learn. If, if the past six months hasn't taught us anything, it's the need to be adaptable. Sure. Um, and I think that's one thing that um, previously may have been underrated um, mm -hmm. that we definitely need to be considering um, for the future. I, love that. I would actually, I would echo that as well. I think Michelle makes a really good point. Um, one of the things we've noticed is the ability for an employee to adapt to a new environment over the last, you know, three or four months uh, was really critical in terms of just not only their contributions from a working standpoint, but just overall within a family circle, you know, within their own, their own personal lives. It, it, it really did show a really interesting tight connection between those two. And that sort of adapt and creative component was really critical for those employees to, to be successful. Should they, how have folks been adaptable or, or changed? How have things changed for you, you know, given especially what you do over the last several months? Yeah, this is an important piece of work we're talking about. I mean, what Michelle and Chris said actually resonated with something that I work on every day, which is um, encouraging play which I know at One Huddle, that's a big thing as well. Like, you know, the, the idea of being agile and flexible and adaptable really comes from the space where we can play and pretend and create. And I think that's something that's super undervalued in workspaces because everybody has to be so serious <laughs> and, <laughs> and stick to, you know, some books and rule books. But in school systems, even if you wanted to take it back a step, our schools, high school students, which we work with, you know, very closely, they are not even related to as people who can play, learn, think for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I work with young people primarily from North New Jersey City, and our black and brown kids are being related to as, you know, or aren't being related to as lead, leaders or learners. Mm -hmm. And also what that does is constrict their ability to play around with things, make mistakes, um, perform in new ways. So I think I think performance and play is definitely undervalued in the workspace. When you talk about some of the limitations or some of the um, sort of, I, you almost describe a box that people are being put in, right? As far as um, what capabilities they are told they have or what flexibility they're told they have. Mm -hmm. What then, as you, as you kind of look at the flip side of, of the question, what is being overvalued as a result of that then? Mm, I honestly think, um, at least from my vantage point, I think that people might overvalue um, where people come from, mm. you know, their backgrounds, um, their experiences, um, because what I find to be a huge, um, I guess, lack in the workforce is untapped potential and talent from the poor community, which doesn't necessarily have access to the mainstream and access to different types of experiences that many people get the job for, you know what I mean? Many people who have these um, experiences and privileges uh, get the job by way of who they know and what they've been able to do 
um, with their with their life and the people who live with them. So yeah, I think overvaluing sometimes, you know, again, where people come from and what they've been able to have access to um, might be overvalued. Yeah, um, Shade, I completely agree. Um, and so glad you brought it up. And I think too, we're, students are put into a system where there's correct answers all the time. Right. Right, like this is a correct answer. Is it on the test? Um, I need to know exactly what the outcome needs to be. So we work a lot with graduate students and it's so hard to give them assignment and say, okay, go do it. And they're like, but, but wait, what is exactly it's supposed to look like? What's the correct answer? What exactly do you want? And so I think they're a part of a system that is tailored to correct answers, A, B, C, or D. Um, and so it stifles that play that Shade was talking about. And so trying to break that mold is difficult. Chris, you were um, you were at Audible for a number of years and worked with Don, who who sits obviously and, and is passionate about the city of Newark and uh, and can speak in a lot of ways to uh, some of the things that uh, Shade is bringing up. As you think about sort of access and uh, the role that private companies have in access, how do you how do you see that as sort of a, an enabler and then in some cases a blocker to the access that uh, that we need to provide across the spectrum of folks that are uh, that are graduating, but also who are learning skills earlier in life? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a good question. And um, I think it builds well off of the comments that, that were just made. I um, I think a couple of things with Audible that we at least did is we were obviously very conscious around focusing our energy and our resources in a given area so we could actually have an impact. Uh, in, in the case of Audible, it's very much around the city of Newark. To get an internship at Audible, you actually have to be in the city of Newark. You have to be a resident from the city of Newark. Um, and that's really the only way that we could work through and really make an impact. Hmm. You know, what, what I think is also really critical is, and, and maybe this ties back a little bit to what's overvalued is, um, you know, what school someone came from or what major they had. You know, when, when I had to, I was very fortunate to, to go to a pretty good business school many, many years ago. and some of the most fascinating, some of the most contributing people in my class were people who were in the Peace Corps, right? Or people who came up in a very, very different environment. Uh, we had a priest uh, in our class. Uh, we obviously had a doctor. That's not too uncommon. Um, but that diversity of thought yeah. to me is what actually drove creativity on, on a much more significant scale. And, you know, for me, that's what companies, in my opinion, need to look more for. And, and I start to see that evolving a little bit. Well, you know, everybody's not going to graduate from an Ivy League institution, and nor, nor should they, and nor does that add the most value to society and to a workforce as a whole. That diversity of perspective, that diversity of experience, um, to me, is really what drives the creativity of a team. And the creativity of a team, in my opinion at least, is what really can drive the success of a company in a long term. Because if you look at any long-term successful company, they continue to reinvent themselves and continue to evolve as they, as they move forward. So that, that's the way that at least, you know, Audible looked at it from, from how they contribute it. And then again, more broadly, sort of how I look at it relative to, to where things need to be a little bit more, um, you know, overvalued, let's say, versus undervalued. I want to ask, um, and maybe I'll kick it back to Michelle for this one, uh, because you work with so many students seeking internships or apprenticeships. Uh, do those internships and apprenticeships, do they make an impact? Absolutely. Um, and I mean, without a doubt. And partly it is just the experience and opportunity. But I do want to point out paid versus unpaid. Hmm. And that's a big issue with if you have the opportunity and privilege to go to an unpaid internship, great. But the vast majority of students who come from lower income families don't have that opportunity. And so what I've really been proud of is um, some of our partners in the Tampa Bay area, for example, the Tampa Bay Lightning, they completely got rid of all unpaid interns. Yes. Completely. Like that was a core fundamental of what they decided to do. And I give that example because then it opens the opportunity for a student who can't afford to go to an unpaid internship. So it, I do believe they provide a great opportunity. Um, for example, this summer, we had, quite quickly, we had to develop about 25 internship opportunities virtually, mm -hmm. right? Um, but they, the students were able to gain experience 
create projects, present those projects to the executives. Um, and that is an opportunity that they couldn't have gotten without an internship. Mm. Yeah. Listen, Michelle, you are saying some things. I almost want to like do a parade with you. Like <laughs> internships is probably the most impactful experience young people can um, participate in. And, and it's not just about the, the talent pipelines either. It's, it's not just, it's not only about learning skills, it is really being in unfamiliar spaces with unfamiliar people and mm. building something and creating new relationships. That's such, it's such a big picture thing. I mean, when I, when I go out and I look for companies to sponsor interns like Lowenstein Sandler or One Huddle, for instance, or PSCG, they, they partner with us not because they're trying to fill um, and, and some work output, they are looking at creating lifetime, long lasting opportunity and change, which I've heard, and Michelle can probably back me up and Chris too, that is impactful for them as well, for the CEOs, for the leaders, for the corporate culture. Internships impact the corporate culture in such a good and, and robust way. It has people who are typically working with the same type of people over and over again, <laughs> see themselves in different ways, see ways that they can advance their thinking, see what I think Chris said so beautifully about diversity of thought. The only way we're gonna be able to create and build new futures and new work is for people who don't agree and who don't look alike <laughs> to come together and have conversation and do something new. That we, you don't build something by using the same thoughts and the same ideas and everybody has to be in agreement all the time. So I love our internship program for that reason in particular. It's a development that happens on both the young people and the executives as well that work with our young people. Today, could Heard, you I would just add that on the, um, on the case of, of the Washington Center, we've, we've probably processed about 65,000 interns over the last 45 years. And I can't count how many are really characterized as truly a transformational experience. I mean, it, it really does bridge that, bridge that gap between the academic and the work life. And everything that Michelle and Chave said is exactly true. And, and even if you look at just some of the basic statistics, I mean, you know, an intern, someone who has done an internship is significantly more likely to get a full-time role, get multiple offers coming out of school. There's all sorts of just basic stats that support it as well. As the, as the anecdotal and just the transformational components. Um, you know, half of the board of the Washington Center is made up of folks who actually went through the program. I mean, we have a brain surgeon from Cornell as an example, um, is, is one, of our, one of my close colleagues. So, um, you know, former ambassadors, people like this. So I, I couldn't echo enough that there's so much value in those. Uh, and, and again, I think what's gonna be interesting is how both students, schools, and the internship employers adapt to this virtual environment. I mean, I, I will say one huddle, I think, done a great job with that, and they've continued to go through that. Um, others are struggling with it more. You know, I have a son trying to do an internship uh, and wanted to do it at Allen, California, and just with everything going on right now in the arts and entertainment business, they're just not in a position to do anything at this juncture. Now, I, I know we're in a really awkward situation, so hopefully that will work itself out. Um, but that's what's going to be interesting is that ability to adapt um, and then to immerse themselves back into a virtual environment. I think it's just going to be part of the core curriculum, let's call it, or, or requirement for, uh, for employers and employees as we move forward. Kirk, um, before we move on to the next question, I want to say, Shade, could you please come and talk to my students the first day of internships? <laughs> like your okay. passion about internships and what they bring Yes, I can say it, but they hear me talk all the time. So I'm going to have you come be a guest speaker on my first I'm day. there. You okay. got me. <laughs> and, and the really cool thing about this, um, I call it the grand adventure of COVID, is that we can be in this virtual space. And today can easily come to my class for 30 minutes. And that has been oh. a really positive aspect of this change um, that I'm really excited about. Yeah, I think Chris nailed that in terms of companies who are um, able to pivot and evolve their business to have these type of opportunities be more, you know, at the forefront. And there are some, you know, companies, at least in my perspective, the nonprofit world, 91% of the after school programs have not been able to do that. Hmm. So it is, it's, it's beautiful what you're saying. Um, 
that this is an opportunity. I love the grand adventure of COVID. I'm stealing that, by the way. Oh, go for it. <laughs> I, I couldn't think of any better way to like spin a positive on it. It's the, it's the most positive spin I've heard for it yet. Um, <laughs> Whether, whether it's COVID related or, or non-COVID related, I'd like to get some perspective on access because I don't think there's any, um, I don't think there's any dissenting opinion, at least from this group, that um, internships have, have uh, tremendous value. But my question is, how accessible are they? You can, again, yeah, funny. Kirk, let me tell you, my job, which is to I, I, we run a, a, a $10 million organization nationally, right? The All-Stars is a national organization. I'm in Jersey. I run the Jersey chapter. Getting internships is actually the hardest part of my job, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. Um, mainly because I am advocating for young people who do not have skill sets or necessary interest in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bridge builder. I'm about bringing young people who, have, who are so isolated and have absolutely no idea that the corporate world is even open to them and that's welcome to them. So now I have to convince um, affluent corporate CEOs that our programs are so important, not only for the young people, but for them and for our communities and for the future of work, which is why I'm so happy to be a part of this conversation. So getting, giving and getting access to internship is not only hard for me, who's a professional, who's who gets to have conversations with people like you, um, it's, it's really hard to advocate for people who are not in the mainstream and who um, don't even necessarily know that this opportunity even exists. Mm. So that's what, so it's hard on both sides, you know what I mean? Getting, getting corporations to understand that there's a need here and that is less about skill and it's less about talent and it's more about access. Mm -hmm. And then getting, you know, talking to our young people and, and getting them a place where they're developed enough to understand and see an opportunity and then act on it and be and feel welcomed in, a, in an environment, in a world that they are not necessarily a part of. Mm. Yeah. And should I add on to that? It is that they can also be successful, right? And they can succeed. are willing to do. Hmm. Um, you have to put that mentorship in. You have to have an actual rigid program put in place. You can't be going on the fly. There has to be structure to it, and it has to be intentional. I think Michelle makes a really good point. I think, you know, the, the access is tough. I mean, at least from our standpoint, we actually are able to get a lot of federal funding and state funding to help support students, uh, and that's something, Shade, I'm happy to follow up with you. Um, outside of this discussion and see if there's anything that the Washington Center and you guys could do together. There could be something there. Um, but part of what we try to bring is it's not just plugging someone into an internship. There is actually a really long process to match mm. to help get funding because, you know, from what we from what we do, you know, an overall funding of an internship in D.C. through our organization, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen thousand dollars mm -hmm. for a semester. Well, most people can't afford that. That's a pretty expensive endeavor. And so there is though federal and state funding that can help support that. A lot of it actually, that the majority of it comes from it. We're actually trying to diversify more to more corporate funding. Because to Shade's point, I um, I don't think there's enough corporations that really um, embrace that need for a stronger, diverse workforce. And not diversity from, okay, where did I go to school? But where did I grow up? What was my environment like? You know. Um, the mix of all of those, I think, is really where it adds a lot of value to companies. I will give Don Katz a lot of credit for that because I think he actually truly embraces that in the case of Endure, and that's why he's so focused around that. Uh, but access is an issue, and I think it's something that's probably got to be brought up in terms of awareness and some very concerted efforts on behalf of schools and companies together that says, okay, how do we, you know, support organizations like the All-Star Project and things of that nature that kind of open up people's eyes to the value that this can provide to a company if you want to get real technical to quote shareholder value right you know that's what every every corporation likes to or used to like to you know tie tie their value to um and i think there's just a lot of opportunity there i do think it's a big it's still a big uphill battle unfortunately i, I guess my um one of my questions because you brought it up earlier michelle was uh paid versus unpaid internship opportunities and i'm curious just across the
corporate roles that you're hearing internships pop up in. How, how is that distributed? I, I mean, is it, you know, it's, is it 50, 50 paid unpaid? Is it, you know, swung much more in one direction or the other? I'm just something to be thinking about. So we talk about policy reform and, and, and ways that we can help bridge that gap. And, and it strikes me, you know, as somebody that grew up in a rural part of Michigan and, uh, I had to search for paid internships because, you know, my mom was a mail carrier. My, or my, I'm sorry, my dad was a mail carrier or my mom was a baker. We couldn't do the $15,000 semester in, in DC, right? So, so how, how have you seen that uh, distribution play now recently, I, you know, in a pre sort of pre COVID world? Um, and, and then what are the trends like in, in that as you've seen that over the last, you know, few years? Yeah, well, I think you've seen with the job reforms and in terms of how people are being paid, um, you're seeing more and more paid internships. There's still a lot where they will come under the umbrella of, well, if you're getting course credits, you can it can be unpaid, and that's where there's a bit of a gap. Um, but there's it's definitely on the increase, specifically in the sport and entertainment industry, um, which is my area. So I can't speak to others, but to that one, you're seeing a lot more paid. You know, what's interesting, Michelle, um, about what you're saying is, well, first of all, the All-Stars, if you come on board and partner with us, it has to be paid. We don't even have an option mm. because our young people can't afford mm -hmm. to go free internships um, or unpaid internships. But what I hear you saying a little bit, I think, I mean, at least what the job reform should be addressing is the fact that companies should look at investing in internships and young people because it put, it makes them accountable it makes them a part of um what we're creating like this future of work you know what i'm saying like it's 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 important to hold people to um a standard and meet a demand for for the young people who are entering the workforce so we should definitely be supporting corporations and jobs to pay young people because then they they got their skin in the game too you know what i mean mm -hmm. um so yeah that's just my little two cents yeah and today we're in the same we're in the same boat and thankfully we're an mba program graduate level so it's a little bit easier but you, if you want to work with us it's paid yeah mm -hmm. and this is pre-covid so let's just be clear yeah. <laughs> right now we're just trying to get any opportunity <laughs> <laughs> that's fair um I want to kind of pivot a little bit here and maybe Chris to, to kind of start with you on this one. As you think about the effectiveness of the learning resources that are, are out there for employees that are offered by their employers, what, what's your assessment of, of the effectiveness of, of those resources that are out there today? And, and how have you seen that evolve? Yeah, I, um, I, I wouldn't, you know, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being they're really outstanding and one of the things people look forward to, one being, you know, the biggest thing that you're not looking forward to. It's hard for me to, to peg them anything higher than about a three. <laughs> okay. But I, I was with Prudential for 18 years and spent a lot of time overseas as well. And, you know, we had to go through compliance-based training, just computer-based compliance training. And in the early days, they were extremely boring at least they've added a little animation to them and they've got a little bit of an entertainment factor to them in some cases. Um, but I don't think that they're, they're anywhere close where they need to be. And I think part of it is, and this goes back to, to I believe it was um, today's comment earlier, which is you know, trying to create an element of fun uh, out of the training and an element of, um, of engagement where employees actually want to learn. I mean, I'm sure Michelle knows this better than anyone, which, you know, when you get a student who just loves a topic, it doesn't matter what you throw at them, they're going to love it and they're going to absorb it. Um, and that's something where I think there's a lot of opportunity. And, and obviously, Sam and I've talked a lot about this through one huddle. And that's why I always was attracted to the gamification component of training because I think you can create a lot of fun with it. You can create some fun competitive environments um, and, you know, really, um, really start to transform it in a whole different level. Um, the other thing that I think that was missing on a topic level that's still missing quite a bit is for me, what I see a lot of training is more almost compliance oriented type of training, you know, training on sexual harassment, training on, you know, discrimination, training on just legal compliance, things of that nature. Whereas I think at an earlier stage in the career, 
there really needs to be more training around leadership, around how to utilize emotional intelligence, how to recognize it, how to capitalize on it, how to develop it. Um, you know, I remember when I was at Prudential, I mean, I had to be at a very high level and an executive level before I got a serious leadership program. Well, mm. by the time I've reached that level, I've got 15 years of leadership. <laughs> You know, in most cases, you can teach the classes more than absorb the classes. And I don't think companies, in my opinion, invest at an early enough stage in those types of skills. And I think if they did, not only would they drive a much stronger employee base from just productivity, but I think they would drive a higher loyalty base, too. And in the tech industry, you know, an, an average tech person is lucky to stay at a company more than 18 months. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially on the technology side, the SDE side, the, the, the engineering side, they move quite a, quite a bit. Uh, and I think these are elements of, um, that can really contribute to that value. I, I, think, I think people will recognize loyalty um, to a company. And I think that's one thing that can be added to that. Why do you think it is that that investment doesn't happen? You know, it's, it's, um, I'd be curious to get anybody's input to that. And then obviously Michelle, please weigh in. But why, why, why do you think it is that if, if we see, if we see the problem, why do you think the investment still doesn't happen? I think you need data to support it. And I think if you go back and you, if, if someone basically just breaks down and says, well, the average employee stays three years now versus 10 years. And so therefore it's not worth me spending $5,000 to do. And I'll make this up an emotional intelligence training curriculum with my group. Um, I think it's a very archaic and a very backwards looking way to think about training. And I think it's, it's you know, to, to use the old terminology, it's probably more of a bean counter approach um, versus someone who's much more proactive and forward looking and says, okay, how do I invest in this employee now? How do I commit to them um, in a way where, you know, that three years turns into 10 years. Mm. Um, and the value in which they start to bring at a leadership managerial and team perspective starts to take hold one year into their career, not seven years into their career or five years into their career. And I think it's the perspective in which people take, at least in my opinion, that's one of the challenges. But I mean, we'd, we'd love to hear Michelle and Sade's perspective so, on Chris, that. Chris, you're going to love this example. So we actually, um, USF, our Vinic program, partners with the Tampa Bay Lightning and actually creates a program just what you're talking about. So it's 10 weeks in the summer when they're not in season and we pick um, they're 10 up and coming brightest leaders, right? They're young. Maybe they have someone who reports under them. Maybe they don't. And it's has two main goals. One is that leadership component, EQ, emotional intelligence, leadership, personalities. But then the other part is business development. So they do a project over 10 weeks. And at the very end of that project, they present to the CEO and the owner of the company. And that has been the most phenomenal thing. We've done it five years in a row. And the learning that's done there that's like hands-on has just been beyond exceptional. So, that's but it, it requires leadership to see the value in it. Yeah, that's terrific. My, my daughter has something similar. She's at Miami, Ohio, and um, they did something similar where um, First Third Bank came in and put forth an initiative. And then the entrepreneur classes actually had to come together and present their initiatives um, or their solution to it. And they presented to presidents of the company. So it, it's a little similar. So I think those are great ideas. They're, they really start to connect that kind of real world piece. It's not a full internship, but it's, it, definitely, it definitely makes that connection. Yeah. And these are actually corporate employees, not students too. Right. Yeah. So it's, it, yeah, it's definitely something that needs to be, happen. And I think people should partner with local universities to help make these happen. Terrific, terrific. I want to um, maybe give everyone a chance to weigh in and, and uh, maybe have a long form narrative here as we, as we get close to wrapping up on, um, on their hopes for the future of work. You know, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of challenges and a lot of concerns that I think uh, we brought to the table and I think a lot of good ideas that we brought to the table too. But as you think in a, in, in a, uh, in a realistic but idealistic fashion, um, and, and where we need to go next uh, to compete, really to give uh, workers on the front lines and, and in the offices around the country a chance to compete. Uh, what is your hope for the future of work? And maybe, Shade, I'd, I'd love for you to, to kick us off and get started. Oh, man, that's a big question. It's a big question. <laughs> 
I think what I when I really even when I sit back and listen to Michelle and Chris, um, you know, from this amazing panel, I would love to see us go past, get to a point where we can't even get past diversity, inclusion, and get to a space of belonging and ownership. I, I would love for the future of work to look like everybody who's a part of it, and even those who aren't yet, feel welcome to it, feel that they can create within it, and feel like they have a voice, a place to belong to. Because I think what, what we kind of miss in the diversity and inclusion conversation is, all right, we want to get a bunch of different people together. Great, that's good. Um, and then we want to make, you know, make sure that everybody's included, right? So we're going to check off a whole bunch of boxes. And that's good. I'm not saying that this is an important stuff. But then what do you do when you bring everybody together? We, we know from history that bringing people together and just saying, hey, let's put everybody together without any context of relationship, without any intimacy, it does not work. We need to do more work in creating spaces and environments where people can be heard, where people can um, provide leadership, young leadership, old leadership, white leadership, black leadership, pops, kids, whatever it is, you know what I mean? And people feel ownership to that work and ownership to this space um, while diversity and inclusion is taking, taking place. So I hope that's the future we can all see. How does it start? <laughs> um, I think we're, we're seeing some things happen now around the world where you know we're, we're confronting some of America's most ugly truths. Um, and you know, when you put some of the, you, you confront some of the systemic issues that we have, people are calling things out more. Um, and what I think needs to start, or at least how it starts is being able to come to a table, come to the table with all of who you are, whatever that means, radically accept each other for who we are and have some really hard conversations about what's next. Um, in, in, in the context of building and creating, not just the context, to, you know, not a blame context and a trivia, like, right. okay, we had it worse in America or why, you know, that, that's not it. Right. <laughs> I'm very much more interested in, we, here's where we are, here's where we want to go. How do we do that? How do we build that? And I honestly feel that you got to do that with different people. You yeah. have to, diversity to me, when you take it to another level, when it's outside of colors and, and, and genders and all these types of things, it's a diversity in thought. And I think Chris said that so beautiful today. And I think if America continued or started to work on accepting people's opinions and beliefs and ideas um, as opportunities to build and create, we can move this agenda forward like light years. Um, but, you know, a lot of times people get stuck in identity and get stuck in the way things were. So we're not able to have a space where everybody belongs. Mm. Um, anyway, I can go on too long about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Um, Michelle. Yeah. So first off, today, thank you for touching my heart today. And I completely agree with you. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more. So one of the things um, I've thought about was, okay, so we were all in these very structured corporate environments. Everyone was dressing a certain way, had a very certain routine. The world up ended. We went home. We got to have a little bit um, more work-life balance, both positive and negative. Um, but we were able to work at home. And I hope, actually, one of my hopes is that all of the positive things from COVID, the reality is that we don't have to be at the office nine to five to get work done. Um, that there can be an opportunity for us to virtually work and get more done um, will actually continue on afterwards and that we have more flexibility. We have more hybrids. We aren't as stringent about what work looks like. And mm -hmm. that is my hope for the I future. Yes. Which is, I would love it. I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm just hopeful. Chris, why don't you finish us off? Well, they, they've hit two of the biggest ones I've had already, so that's terrific. Um, <laughs> I 100% I you know, endorse this, the diversity component. I, I think you know, to, to your question on how do we, well, what's the first step or what's the steps we need to take? I mean, to me, it's got to be leader-led. It, it has to start with current leadership, and it has to be ingrained in the culture of a company. Otherwise, it won't, it won't change. Um, 
I mean, we, we all have habits, some good, some bad, and we know how difficult they are or how difficult they are to create and to break. And, and it's the same, unfortunately, the same, the same thing here. Um, so I, I think, you know, the value of diversity has to be, to me, that's got to be one of the most critical components and one of the biggest things I hope we've learned over the last two or three months uh, beyond COVID, obviously, with Black Lives Matter and everything else that's going on around before that, the Me Too movement and everything, you know, and, and my hope is leaders will actually own this stuff. And, and you won't get the, and I can speak because I probably fall in the category, at least, you know, genetically as the old white guy who leads these companies. Um, there has to be a different perspective from a leadership standpoint at, at all levels. Uh, and that has to flow through the organization. And it has to start with, with you know, the very front line at internships and students and any hiring practices and, and start to work through that. Um, second to Michelle's point, I think the ability in recognizing that flexibility in a work environment is going to be critical. Um, and, and to her point, you you don't have to be physically connecting to one another all the time to be productive. In some cases, you can be more productive without doing that. Um, you know, the nine to five is not going to is not the norm anymore. It could be a nine to 11.30 and three to 6.30. And you know what? I got to get on at midnight and do something. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I've been lucky in my, my job of international. I've always had to do that because, you know, my teams have set around the globe. Yeah. And it's interesting how after about the first month, people started to get a little bit more into that rhythm and the ability to adapt. And I think people recognize not only the value of it, but they started to appreciate some of that flexibility. I will just say a caution has to be that, that again, going back to leaders, um, it's also easy to get kind of locked in and working 14 hours a day on doing that too. And, and you know, and you've got to kind of, we, we instilled things, at least at Audible, where, okay, no meetings on Thursday afternoon between noon and six o'clock. Um, no meetings every day between 12 and one. But local time in each office had their own options to do it but you had to force a little bit of that. Um, the only thing I might add is I think in order to make these things successful uh, overall, I do think there needs to be a knowledge transfer and there needs to be tools to help facilitate that knowledge transfer. Uh, I think you know, organizations like USF and other institutions, universities, uh, I think they can start with them changing the way in which they approach the teaching environment and how that flows into the work environment. Um, a good close friend of mine was the former president of Elon University, and he's leading a lot of their effort right now on how they're going to adapt to this. And everything is on the table, everything. And one of the big factors they're looking at is what tools do we need to bring in to help facilitate this knowledge transfer and this knowledge growth? I think that's going to be interesting. I think that's where, honestly, that's where some of the most interesting, I think, startups will start to come from. Um, you know, when you go forward in the case of, um, of a post-COVID environment, um, which I don't think will ever be completely post. Uh, I think the tools and the ability to adapt to these environments, wherever they come from, are going to be critical. I mean, I, I do think one huddle set up pretty well for that. It's, a, it's a, one example. There's a lot of other ones, too. But it's going to be interesting to see what creative companies and organizations come out of this, because they'll come out for sure. So that's the only thing I would probably add. I, again, I, I think Sade and Michelle's points um, around diversity and flexibility and adaptability um, are probably the most core. And then it's just the enablers to actually ingrain that into the habits and grow those roots deeper. Fantastic. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you, Michelle, Shade, Chris. Thank you for being a part of the Compete uh, Future of Work event today. And I, I just want to, again, um, just say how important it is that we have the opportunity to learn from and hear each of your individual perspectives. It's uh, it's really a privilege to have you join us, and, and we just thank you for taking the time out today. So with that, uh, we will wrap today's session and uh, head back to the next piece of the event. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Sade. Thank Pleasure. Nice to meet you guys.